Back in 2004, there was a time of trouble upon the earth. The 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake triggered a series of devastating tsunamis up to 30 meters, 100 feet high, inundating the coastal areas, coastal communities, along the coast of the Indian Ocean, and killing an estimated of 227,898 people in 14 countries. The earthquake was one of the deadliest natural disasters in recorded history, the deadliest of the 21st century so far. Indonesia was the hardest hit country, followed by Sri Lanka, India, and Thailand. I'd like you guys to take a look at the screens, and you're going to see a short little video. It's four minutes long, but pay attention, please. And 
and then we have a hurricane. Will you prepare? If you know a cataclysmic event is on its way, will you prepare? How many of you believe in the Bible? How many of you believe in every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 says, There is a day that's going to come, a time of trouble, that's going to be unlike any time in earth's history, even since there was a nation. And at this time, Michael will stand up. When is it, is it time to prepare? Now, if you know a time of trouble is coming upon this earth, you're a Christian. When the day starts off with peace and safety, then what happens? Sudden destruction comes. That's what's going to happen for those that are lost and do not prepare. We are to be people of the book. We are to go to the mountaintops and prepare a world, just as Israel did. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. You know, I, I did my best to put a clip together to make it as G as possible. But if you really know the scenes of what took place that day in 2004, it was pretty graphic, it was pretty bad. So I say to myself, I read in the Bible a prophecy in the book of Daniel that Jesus is coming and the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon this world. But yet, we seem to be sleeping. We seem to be that type that is, that is at saying peace and safety. And it is troubling. As Seventh-day Adventists, we've been given a job to go to the mountaintops and preach a message. Laodicean world, wake up. Something's about to take place. How do you prepare? When do you prepare? Those people there, it was just a regular day, and it just, it ended for them so quickly. What is the coming crisis? I know we have some friends in the audience, and some of you just come in, and maybe you're about to hear for the first time, an Adventist message. You're going to hear some commentary that I'm going to share that was given to our church in the 1800s. And it was about preparing a people, preparing a world to usher in the coming of Christ. And it's never an easy sermon to give when it has to start off like this. But just know God's people, it says in Daniel, will be delivered. God's people will be delivered, but it's going to be based on which side you want to be on. Not the side that God wants you on, but the side that God has given you a choice to go on. Oh, I think I'm past it. It says, those who exercise with little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions and the decree to compel the conscience. And even if they endure the test, they will be plunged into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they have never made it a habit to trust in God. The lessons of faith, which they have neglected, they will be forced to learn of the terrible pressure and discouragement now, this is taken from a book called The Great Controversy. What is the last controversy going to be on? It's about worship, yes? Where do you find worship in the Word of God? And what commandment do you find worship? The fourth commandment. There is going to be a decree coming upon this world where you cannot buy and sell unless you have the mark. What is that mark? And this is something we have to look into. What beast is going to push that mark in and enforce it? For those of you who are not familiar with this, I implore you to look up blue laws. 
They've been on the books since the 1800s. Yes, in this country too. It has not been forced under the penalty of death or imprisonment. But as most of you know, the Sunday law, the mark of the beast, it's progressive. It's progressive. You start hearing it agitated. I'll be on the news, reading some articles, but it will progress. It will progress. And this is what the final controversy of this world is going to be about. Worship. True worship. We are to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? Amen. By a show of hands, because I know we have guests, how many of you keep the Sabbath day? Amen. Put your hands down. I don't want you to raise your hands after this. I want you to think about it. How many of you keep the Sabbath day holy? Okay? It's just something to think about. How many keep it holy? Because if the coming crisis is going to be about worship, what are you doing now to prepare your hearts to be ready? Because if we're like this, teeter-tottering, what's going to happen when it's, we're faced and you have to feed your kids? You can't buy, you can't sell. You never took the time to prepare. What's going to happen? You might go to the other side out of peer pressure. This is why I think this message is urgent today. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me to teach you, to share, to talk about the sifting, to talk about the shaking, small time of trouble, big time of trouble, Michael is standing, death decree, and try to put it and give you a synopsis of it in a short period of time. I'm going to try my best to pray, pray for me while I'm up here, but just know I'm going to ask you when you go home and when you collect yourselves together, study it out. Make it important to you. Find out who is God's church? Why you've been called to come to God's church? And what are the truths for the end of this world? At some point, the end is going to come. Daniel 12 says, you might not be ready if you're not getting ready now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we hear your word today, as you have given me an opportunity to come and share your word, I pray for each and every listener that is here, that they may hear you. Hide me in the cross of Christ. Humble me as I speak. But let every home, every living person that is here, prepare themselves as they hear this message. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And at that time, Michael shall stand up. Who is he? The great prince, which standeth for the people, the children of thy people. And there was a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that is found written in the book. So there's going to be a separation of two people, two classes of people. Some are going to experience the wrath of God that we poured out without mixture. Some people will go through Jacob's trouble. So there's two groups at this end. Two groups. Which group do you want to be in? The one that has prepared themselves for Jacob's trouble? Or the one that's going to go through the wrath of God? The Bible says that. And this time we'll be poured out without mixture. Jeremiah 37 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But what's going to happen? They will be saved out of it. Amen? Amen. Great news? Yes. Does God deliver his people? Yes. Did he deliver the three Hebrew boys? Yes. Did he deliver Daniel? Yes. Did he deliver you? 
Amen. Through Jesus. Amen. Let's look at that word, trouble. It's a Hebrew word from Strong Concordance 6869, and it's pronounced Sarah, or Sarah, if you, if you please. The T is silent. What does it mean? It says adversary, adversity, affliction, anguish, distress, tribulation, trouble. I think it's important sometimes to go take a look. What is God trying to tell us? Are we as a people going to go through adversity? Are we going to go through anguish and distress? Yes. So when the book of Daniel, chapter 12, opens up, it opens up with a, what word? What's the word in your Bible? What's the first word it says? In Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1, what does it say? I just, louder. And. That's a weird way to open up a chapter. And. Right? And. So what, why is that? What does it mean? It's simply alluding to what's going on in the previous verse. Get that? And at that time, so apparently there was something going on at the end of chapter 11. That's important to understand as well. Now, I can't get into all those things, but that's what causes Michael to stand up, okay? So it's a continuous time frame of what's being spoken about in chapter 11. What's happening there in chapter 11, the end? God's last day people, the remnant, they're called, okay? They're under the great power of the Holy Spirit, or as we understand, the latter rain, right? And... They're kind of standing in the way of the papacy to rule this world. Maybe some of you don't, don't understand that, but the papacy's wound is going to be healed. And in that time, there's going to be a threefold union. Okay? A threefold union. This is almost like the anti Trinity, so to speak. And this coalition of this threefold union is apostate Protestantism. Yeah, unfortunately, the lamb like beast will speak like a dragon. The papacy. Who else? Spiritualism. Now, this is when the sermon kind of takes off here. I wanted to bring a slide and put something together, but time didn't allow it, and I guess the Lord didn't allow it. But spiritualism is going to have a big effect on this world. Let me read something to you. From page 190, Maranatha, the threefold union of religion. Now, this is the subtitle, okay? It's dated July 1st. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation, the United States, will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with spiritualism, when, under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution, and it's coming, as a Protestant and Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation, which means like increase, to reproduce, like to spread, of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Okay? In 1 John 4, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out of this world. Spiritualism. Spiritualism is here. Listen, we have friends, dear friends, probably better Christians than you and I are in the other churches. That's why God says to come out of her. Those are God's people in those churches. But what's happening in the other churches? We see the tongues. We see the spiritualism. Eastern mysticism is in our ranks. 
And I could tell you, these deceptions that are going on to other churches is going to be what is going to ensnare many of the people. If you don't have a good foundation of what happens when you die, our Elder Johnson was up here two weeks ago. Pastor was up here last week. Talked about the coming of Jesus, and we talked about what happens when someone dies. Do, do you talk to your loved ones? Do they come back and talk to you? That's what people think. That's what they're, but what does the Bible have to say about that? Where do they go? Are they burning? Is God really allowing them to be burned to Christ for all eternity? No. What's going to happen when certain manifestations, think about this, the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from the earth, being withdrawn from the hearts of the people. Who's having full control? The spirit of devils, Satan himself and all his minions. And he is going to run amok. What's going to happen to all the fallen churches? The so-called people, you know, that are striving so hard. What's going to happen to them? They're going to fall for these deceptions. Spiritualism is alive and it's in our ranks now. What do you think is going to happen in time of trouble? When the restraint that's been upon your hearts is slowly withdrawn away. Are you going to be able to stand during that time? What are you going to do when... You see apostles. What are you going to do when you see loved ones just come back and start telling you, oh no, things were changed in the Bible. It's like this now. You're going to believe it if you're not grounded in the Word of God. You're going to believe it. What are you going to believe? A lie. When did that lie begin? In the very Garden of Eden. You shall not surely die. Shall not surely die. That's from my understanding is probably one of the first lies that we know of, at least on the earth. We know there were there were some others that started in heaven. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse nine. I'm going to read through verse twelve. It says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. From Great Controversy, chapter 88, page 553, Paragraph 1, many will be ensnared through the belief that spiritualism is merely a human imposture, but when brought face-to-face -face with manifestations, they cannot but regard as supernatural. They will be deceived and will be led to accept them as the great power of God. Moving down a few pages, it says, as the teachings of spiritualism are accepted in the churches, the restraint imposed upon the carnal heart is removed, and the profession of religion will become a cloak of to conceal the basest iniquity, the most evil, in other words. A belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door for to do seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and thus the influence of evil angels will be felt in the churches. In the churches. You guys have heard of the Kundalini? Raise your hand if anybody here. Wow, all right. Okay, that's good. What is the kundalini? These are already evil spirits. When you see people running around in the church and jumping around, show me that in the Bible, that godly people do that. And the tongues. I understand there's some placebo going on there. I understand there's some hypnosis going on there, but there's also the kundalini. There's also evil spirits doing this, manifesting this and deceiving our beautiful, loving brothers and sisters. And they say, oh, you know, we're slain in the spirit. We're drunk in the spirit. Well, show me God's apostles doing this. Show me the prophets doing that. 
This is why we have to go out and teach and share and baptize. Time's running out. Time is coming. Revelation 16, 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And there's that three-fold union again. Frogs. Frogs were used during the plagues. What's a frog's weapon? It's tongue out of the mouth. You know? Verse 14, for they are, what are they? Spirits of devils. Hear the definition? What are they? They are spirits of devils. Working what? Miracles. Many will say, Lord, Lord, did we do these miracles in your name? Lord said, I don't know you. But wait a minute. They know, Lord. they know the Lord, and they're doing miracles. What does that tell you? If they were doing miracles, what does that tell you? If the Lord don't know them, who is doing the miracle? Satan. Think about that. Satan was doing the miracles the whole time. Maybe you had cancer, and now you're cancer-free, and you know it. No, ain't nobody going to change your mind. But guess who put the cancer on you? Satan. But then you go to this faith healer, and he, t and he removes it from you, and you believe. And I can understand why you would believe. But I can also understand you were a Christian and you didn't know your Bible. You should have known Satan was doing that. And Satan takes the cancer away. God says, what are going to say? We did miracles. That's not demons. We did many wonderful works. But God says, I don't know you workers of iniquity. Right? What is this world going to be like when this time comes? This short time of trouble. In Revelation 18, 2 and verse 3. Revelation 18, 2 and verse 3. And he cried with a mighty strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, is fallen as is become the habitations of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Why? What's going on? For all nations have drunk the wine and wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Let me tell you, a lot of these charismatics, these churches, they're drunk already. Seriously. They're ensnared already. And God wants us to call them out. You know, I, I'm standing up here and I'm saying to myself, are we understanding? How many people are reading their Bibles and asking the Holy Spirit, guide me, show me. This church was given a gift in the spirit of prophecy. What does the Bible say? These are they who keep the commandments of God. Yes? But they have the testament of Jesus Christ. Well, keep reading the book of Revelation. These are they who keep the commandments of God. Therefore, they have the right to eat from the tree of life. There's something about those commandments that the other churches are saying, no, we're under grace. We don't need them. Oh, Jesus is my Sabbath. Well, Jesus gives me rest. I believe that. Amen. But Jesus is not the Sabbath day that we are to keep holy. Jesus is holy. The day is holy. God is holy. The commandments are holy. Therefore, he wants us to be holy beings. Listen, the deceptions around this world is going to be great. It's going to be grand. Some of us and our own loved ones are going to see apostles. I'm sorry about the slide. It looks like I put red in there and I probably shouldn't have. I'm going to read it for you. Moreover, the apostles... Church, listen to this, please. Just listen. Moreover, the apostles as personated by these lying spirits, are made to contradict what they wrote at the dictation of the Holy Spirit when on earth they denied the divine origin of the Bible and thus tear away the foundation of the Christian hope and put out the light 
the light that reveals the way to heaven. What, what are they going to do? What are they going to be telling you? They're going to tell you some different things about the Bible. So guess what? When you're there and you see the Apostle John, Peter, Paul, whoever your favorite apostle is, and they're telling you, no, man, you're to keep any day you want, or you're to keep Sunday. You know, I, I, I'm reading through this, studying through this, and I'm saying to myself, well, you know, I remember I grew up in some of these charismatic churches, and I was told, hey, also Elijah and Moses is coming back. Right? Have anyone heard that before? Elijah and Moses come back. These are the two witnesses. Here, Old and New Testament, my two witnesses. But when you're told they might come back, and then they come back, ah, my church, right. You see, they were wrong. You see it? You get it? Building a temple. What if they start building a temple? Ah, my church was right. Look, we're building a temple. We, got to, we, we have to get back to our Bibles. If not, we're going to be ensnared. We really, we really are. But you could see how this deception, it, it's, just, it's going to be bigger than we can probably handle. And if we're not doing today what we have to do to get ready, when that day comes, we're not going to make it. The distress is going to be too great. It's going to be too great. How many understand what I'm, what I'm talking about here? You guys understand? You get it? Okay. Okay. Let's begin the second phase of this. I can see the clock is running, and the clock's our enemy right now. It doesn't want to stop. Amen. The commencement of the time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to the time when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but to a short period just before they are poured out. While Christ is in the sanctuary, and that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming to the earth, and the nations will be angry, yet held in check, so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. So the time of trouble that comes, it's not necessarily the time that has been spoken of that will come. So what we have to understand is, there's a time of trouble. I'm going to tell you right off the front, it's called... Small time of trouble, short time of trouble, little time of trouble. While Jesus is still in the sanctuary, and he is, judgment began at first with the, those that have died. At some point, judgment is going to start with the living. Yes? While mercy is still given to us, there's going to be a time when the threefold union, when the image of the beast then the mark of the beast is coming. God's saints are going to go to this world. It says every nation, tongue, clime, and people. And we will belt the world. But we're going to get help. There's going to be something called the latter rain. What is the latter rain? What is the latter rain? The Holy Spirit. The early rain at Pentecost... Right? Early rain was the Holy Spirit descending. And it gave them what? Power. How many of you are shy? <laughs> Any shy people here? Don't raise your hand because you're shy. Then you raise your hand, you're not shy. Okay? You ain't shy. Stop that. <laughs> well, guess what? When that rain comes, you ain't going to shut up. Amen. You ain't going to shut up. You may give them power. That's what the early rain did to those apostles. And that shyness went away. Even to where, like, go ahead, kill me. I don't care. Brother Foster, right? Paul, today you're teaching Sabbath school? No problem. Prophet will come tell you. Prophet will come tell you. Don't go. I'm going. I don't care. We're going to need that. And that time, the latter rain, 
or refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give the power to the loud voice of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. To stand during when? The seven last plagues. So where are we during the seven last plagues? Here. Who are God's people? Us. You better believe you're part of God's people. If you don't start believing it now, when are you going to start believing it? Then? Too late. Too late. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. And we're going to, we spend time in the Bible for a reason. So it doesn't come from Brother Ace. It doesn't come from this one or that one. What does the Bible say? Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? Blotted out. Your sins will be blotted out. When? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The latter rain. The latter rain. What do we do with our friends and all those churches? What do we do? Remember, they're our dear friends. And they're better Christians than us, most of them. Because I know many of them. They're better than me. I'll say I'm going to say that. God says, those are my people. I saw that God had children who do not see this and keep the Sabbath. They had not rejected the light on it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost. Light of rain. As we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. What happens after this? What, is, what happens to the other people now? This enraged the churches and nominal Adventists as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God's chosen all saw, the, saw clearly that we had the truth and came out and they endured the persecution with us. Amen? And I saw that sword, famine, pestilence, and great confusion in the land. The wicked thought we had brought the judgments down upon them. I'm going to stop right there. If the wicked thought they brought the judgments down upon them, that means the plagues have fallen. You guys get that? You catch it? The plagues have already started because they believe it's caused those plagues is because those people who are keeping the Sabbath, those people who think they're holy. What did they do? They rose up and took counsel to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil will be stayed. What is counsel? They took counsel, law, decree. You guys catching that? Law, decree. If the plagues had just commenced and it just started, boils, and now the sun. Oh, imagine having boils and then the sun. How does that feel? Well, they take counsel. Some kind of law is going to pass. Can, can they do that? Can they make a law to go after God's people? Hmm. I wonder. Let's, let's, I, it's a lot, so let's review a little bit here. I, it's hard for me to pen down and explain to you what it's going to be like during this time. It's just not possible, you know? Let me share this real quick. Um, I told my wife I was going to share something here, um, and I hope, hope she don't mind. We were young. We, we were, uh, <laughs> yeah, we were young. Um, I want to say universal. I don't know. I don't remember. And, you know, you, you go to these, these trips, and you have to stay in these lines, at least back in the 90s, um, sometimes an hour just to go on a dumb ride. But my wife is the brave person. She wears the pants those days. <laughs> and I'm the chicken. I don't like these roller coasters and all this stuff, you know? So we go in this ride, and I want to say it was doors opened up. It was like an elevator door, and, and then the elevator would drop. So some of you who have experienced they know what it is, right? So Brother Ace is going through this line. Think about this. 45 minutes an hour. Five more minutes. Another five minutes. Eventually we get there. But do you know the anticipation, my stress level, to go on this ride? And I'm a chicken as it is. And I get to this ride. They put me in this elevator. And then it goes down and up and all these different things. And I'm like, 
Well, I mean, checking about it, it's not that bad. Yeah, a little bit scared, but it was nothing. So, of course, it makes me go on other rides and something like this stuff ain't nothing. But here's the problem. When the time of trouble comes, the anticipation of what you're going to think and feel and what's going to happen there, when it happens, it's actually going to be worse than your anticipation. God said so. God said it's going to be worse. Unlike any time in Earth's history, it's going to be that bad, especially for those that the wrath of God is going to come upon. But God's people we're dealing with, what did we talk about that time of trouble was? Anguish, right? Heart, you know? Are we worried about the plagues? At this point, do we know that we're part of the 144,000? Sure. But we're going to have to deal with our memories, our mind. We're going to have to deal with sins that we felt that we didn't confess yet. These are the things we'll worry about. We want to vindicate God's name. That's what we're worried about. We're not worried about death. I mean, seriously, if you just really sit and think about it, and the plague is like, you already know you've made it. We just have to endure it. And that's why the latter rain falls, because it prepares us as well to stand. <laughs> review. Let's review. So we have the latter rain that falls upon God's people. Like Pentecost did, prepared them to go to the ends of the world. Early rain? What brings in the harvest? The last rain. God used seasons and times and stuff to explain to the Hebrews. So you have this latter rain that falls upon God's people, which gives them power to preach. What do they preach? The three angels' message. What church preaches the three angels' message? In the entire world. One church. The only church that knows it. Think about it. This equals the loud cry. Every nation, tongue, climate people. The work is closing. Let's start with Michael. At this time... After all these things take place, short time of trouble, okay, Michael stands up. Who's Michael? Where's, where's my loud voices here? Where, Mike in the front? Okay. Yeah, I want to I I do some scripture reading, okay? I want to call a couple of people just to read some scriptures. In John chapter 5, verse 25. Karina, you want to take that for me, please? Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall hear, shall live. For as the Father had lived, for as the Father had life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And has given on him authority to excuse judgment also, because he is just, the son just, of man. Marvel not just, at this, just, for the just, hour is coming, and the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Amen. Listen, she just said, they shall hear the voice of the Son of God, verse 25. So the hour is going to come when all those that are in the graves are going to hear his Voice. Brother Leon. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. First Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Okay, so what, listen, if I'm a Bible student, okay, and I'm trying to figure out, I'm asking you, Michael is standing. Who is this person, Michael, that stands for the people? 
and everyone that's written in the book of life. Okay? My understanding, when I hear the word name in scripture, it's a Hebrew word called Shem, which means character. My God is not short in character, so he has many, many names. Amen? Michael is a name that was used for Christ in the Old Testament. Another one of his names, other than Jehovah, other than the angel of the Lord. Son of God, Jehovah Emmanuel. So if I'm reading this as a Bible student, when they shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall hear and live, and then I read another prophet tell me that the Lord himself comes from heaven with a shout, and the voice is the archangel. What is ark? Ark means chief. Angel means messenger. Guess who is the mighty great prince, the messenger of the father, the son? Jesus. That's simple. Thank you. Look, I want to share you a nugget. Anybody like nuggets? Little nuggets? Nuggets of truth? Isaiah 9, 6, 4. It's up here if you could read it. For, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called what? Wonderful. Keep that in, up there real quick. Okay? Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Okay, Michael, the Prince. Okay? Watch this. Judges 13, verse 17 and 18. Just a quick note. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, he's talking to Jesus here, what is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And look what Jesus said. Look what the angel Lord says. And the angel Lord said unto him, Why askest thou, why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Well, take that word secret. Look it up in Hebrew. In Hebrew, in Strong's Concordance, 6383, do I have it up there? Let me see. Okay, here you go. Sorry about that. The word secret is wonderful. Who is that wonderful person? Isaiah 9, 6 what says it was the Son of God, the mighty God, the Almighty for the Prince of Peace. He's my Prince. He's my King. He's my Savior. Little nugget there. Threw it in. We got to move. Trying to get to the heart of this. So Michael, see this book? This book is the Geneva Bible. 1599. Before the King James, 1611. Old book. I know you can't read it. I did the best I could, but you can't read that. But when you look at that, the commentators there, 1599, they knew who Daniel was. I'm sorry, they knew who Michael was. In Daniel 10.13, it's a little highlighted in red. It says, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there by the kings of Persia. So when you look at that footnote down below in the explanation of Michael, the commentator says, Though God could by one angel destroy all the world, yet to assume his children of his love, or sure his children of his love, he sent him forth double power. Even Michael, that is Christ, Jesus, the head of all angels. Our forefathers knew this. What what happened? Let me tell you something. That's just because of time. I could only show you a little bit. But I'm asking you guys, go ahead and study this stuff out. Our forefathers, they knew it was Jesus. But they get little groups go out there and try to change things. And then some other group wants to say he's an angel with wings and, and he's a created being. And then you could see how people start disbelieving. But Michael stands. Every time we've gone to Scripture and Jesus ascended, it said he went and he sat down at the right hand of the Father, God. But it comes to a point where he will be finished of his work. 
in the sanctuary, and he will stand up. You ever have a court scene? And when that judge is done, all rise. The verdict has been made. These are in the book of life. The kingdom has been given to Jesus. Right? The government will be on his. I'll be happy. Guess who's fighting for me now? You know? I just, want to, I just want to continue to prove this point real quick. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Hmm. Stephen's being stoned, and he sees Jesus standing. But all the passages say Jesus went and sat down. What Stephen saw was a glimpse of Jesus standing at the end of earth's history. And oh, by the way, it's 34 AD, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. Stephen is stoned. The probation closed on the Jewish nation at this time. 34 AD, God now turns to the Gentiles, who's given a glimpse of Michael and Jesus standing. Is that you guys see how you could just sew it together, line upon line, precept upon precept? But then you might go talk to your priest or your pastor or somebody else. No, 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 no. It's 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 like this. Do the homework yourself. Believe the Holy Spirit could guide you, not man. Revelation twenty two eleven. He that is unjust at this point, when preparation closes, will be unjust still. He that is filthy will be filthy still. Right. He that is holy, be holy still. When the ark door closed, all those who were outside were filthy. They were lost. All those that were inside the ark, they were prepared. They were holy. God saw them righteous before him. If there's a typology, we could always use typologies to figure these things out. Michael stands, probation closes. When probation closes, what's going to happen? Plagues, right? Listen, who's running this world right now? Satan. He's the puppet. Satan flexes his muscles in plain sight. He's our entertainment business, television he gets you, the drugs, pornography. He gets you. He uses sights. This sight, your eyes, the lamp of your body. He knows that. He also uses sight, S-I-T-E-S. Okay? Hollywood. You got, what's that, Daffy Duck down the bottom there? What's the door? What's the number on the door? 666. That's our children's show. You want to go back to the first one? Oh, there you go. Got it. Entertainment business. Satan hides it all in plain sight. And usually behind the curtains, he's doing his bidding. Behind the curtains. How many of you know about this trilogy called The Purge? Anybody? Okay, so some of you have, have seen this trilogy. I don't know how many years ago was it? Eight years ago, seven years ago? My wife and I were at the house. This commercial comes on, and I tell her, wait, turn that back? Think of this with DVRs, right? I'm like, a law, a decree to kill people, to purge? So I said, you know what? Even back then, babe, I don't watch movies, but let's rent this thing. Let's see what this thing's about. I rent it. I'm like, this is what our church has been saying for over 160 years. Do you guys mind staying a little bit longer? Please. This movie. Parents, you've been warned. You've been warned. Be careful what you let your kids watch. Okay? Be careful. 
you don't realize you're playing to Satan's hand. Purge. The movie The Purge is about, listen carefully, the rebirth of America, with America in social unrest and plague with fighting many wars, which also leads to an economic crash. America turns to a new order, a new organization with a different philosophy. They vote in new founding fathers, which replace the place of a president. Government now sanctions a night of lawlessness, which forms the very backbone of this series. What is their solution to fix America? A day of purge, a cleansing. A law has been established in that one day of the year is voted in to allow the citizens to go out and listen, kill other citizens. This law that will be enacted at, is as a solution for all that is going wrong in the world and people will go along with it. You hear that? For all these little things that's going on, let's put this law in and go kill these people to fix the problem. Hollywood, Satan knows already about <laughs> the time of trouble. He knows about the death decree. Guess who's the father of that? Satan. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. We've told, we, we know that. There is nothing new under the sun. Believe me. I'm share with you guys this. The Fugitive Slave Law or Fugitive Slave Act was passed by the United States Congress on September 1850 as part of the compromise of 1850 between Southern slaveholding interests and Northern free soilers. This was one of the most controversial elements of the 1850 compromise and heightened Northern fears of a slave power conspiracy. It required, keyword, it required that all the escaped slaves were upon capture to be returned to their masters and that officials and citizens of free states had to cooperate with this law. It's being forced. Abolitionists nicknamed it the bloodhound law for the dogs that were used to track down runaway slaves. I know my, my young students here know, know who Frederick Douglass is. Here's what, look what he writes. In, in Frederick Douglass newspaper, the North Star, the editors referred to the use of the law as man-stealing in reference to the Bible verse, Exodus 21, 16, that reads, and he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. <laughs> listen, our country has already done similar things. If you think, listen, if you really think that that will never happen, that this country will never pass a law to go after its citizens, go look up history. In 1850, it's already happened. Now, they didn't kill them. I'm sure some people died. But this has happened before. Don't think it's so far-fetched that a law can be placed. I know we're going over time here. God's wrath is going to be poured out without mixture. God's people will stand on that day. I'm going to implore you guys to go home. If you're not familiar with some of these writings, you're not familiar with, with some of our history and these teachings, call somebody, ask someone, talk to an elder, talk to our pastor. There are a lot of young, learned brothers and sisters here that can share. There's a few more I wanted to share with you, but I can see because of time I can't. But I'm going to tell you this. God's people will stand. This sermon ends with God's people will be delivered. And I think I'm going to do a part two now. Okay? I don't want to have to. Jesus. When Satan came to him in the wilderness... He tried to tempt Jesus. He said, it is written. John 14, 30. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and nothing in me. Nothing. No temptation can move Jesus. We will stand. Why? Our bread and water will be sure. Our bread and water will be sure. Hungry? You cannot be tempted at this point. 
Some people say, oh, we won't sin anymore. He can't tempt us. It's not possible. Our faith cannot be moved. And Jesus gave us a glimpse of that. He said he had nothing in me that he could tempt. Brother and sisters, there's hope in Jesus Christ. He's your Savior. We'll be, there's going to be a time without an intercessor there. Some people have trouble when, they, when you hear, oh, but we won't have an intercessor. His work will be finished. You know what we have? A king. We have a king. We have a savior. He's our all in all. I pray that you guys go home and study this out. Sabbath school, classes are for a reason. Get to know one another. Have fellowship lunch. Talk about these topics. Talk about what you need to do to get ready. Iron sharpeneth iron. We need each other. The days are closing. A time of trouble is coming. Will you prepare? God said he will deliver us. God bless you.